Good evening. Actually, it's another day. It's Monday, August 1st, and it's like 12 o'clock. I'm just getting in off the road. I went to San Pedro, California um, to support one of my crochet sisters, and I'm so glad I did. It was very inspiring, but that's another story. I'm in Facebook jail again, and I uh, wanted to apologize for not being uh, here on Sunday when I said I would be because I didn't know I was going to go on Facebook jail. I don't know why I posted my dolls, and um, I don't know, maybe they saw something that made them think that uh, I shouldn't be on Facebook. Wink, wink. So... I'm not going to uh, tarry long, uh, but I do want to continue reading. Look at my book. I done tore my book up. I need another book as well. I got to get another book. We are in the midst of a power of prayer and meditation. And even though some of the things that I have done, you know, I put myself in this predicament, uh, but at the same time, uh, I believe the enemy is after me because we only have this much more to go. And it's basically about prayer and character and um, good stuff. Excuse me. That uh, I believe the enemy does not really want some of you to... Uh, hear about it but we go keep on pressing on we'll put this on YouTube and then I'm gonna distribute it amongst the ones that I know uh, have been following since uh, we started this we're almost done and but I'm the type of person that uh, once I start something I must complete it to the best of my ability so I have my book I have uh, steps to Christ uh, yeah I was gonna, a minute we're up on the steps to Christ. Uh, well, I have the um, card back. The other one is in a room somewhere. I don't want to get up. But, uh, let me see what page it was on. Uh, It's hard to tell. Huh. Oh, let me go to my notes. Let me see. Steps to Christ, page 15. Let me see if it's the same as the other book. Because we was talking about the impurity of lips. You know what? I'm going to have to pause. Station identification. Let me go get Steps of Christ. Oh, I almost knocked out of my cup. Okay. I am so, uh, what you call it? Unorganized. Oh, darn. I didn't open my Bible. <laughs> Here it is. Okay, with that note, 
Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, for bringing Velma and myself across the highways and the byways, Lord. I pray that everybody that came for the fashion show, Lord Jesus, make it home safely, especially those who come from afar. And um, I thank you for letting me meet Kristen. She's such a wonderful soul, Father God, and I'm so proud of her work. And I'm so glad that she is as inspiring as she is so that I can do more with what I create myself. Lord, as we dwell into the Word, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will bless us to receive it, understand it, uh, have spiritual discernment and wisdom and understanding and guidance, Lord Jesus. And I'm saying that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. It shall not prosper, Lord. It's going to form, but it's not going to prosper. I thank you for giving me the spirit of continuation, Lord Jesus. And I pray that I will be clear and precise with what I read to your children, God. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to get myself together as well as to read in the hopes that others will get themselves together as well. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, please accept this prayer on all our behalfs. Amen. All right, let's get into Steps to Christ. I'm going to read a couple of columns of that. Uh, we left out saying, if they have so high a conception of what a Christian should be, it is not their own sin so much the greater. Is not their own sin so much the greater. They know what is right, yet refuse to do it. And... Um, Steps to Christ on page 15 was talking about, uh, what is that? The impurity of the lips. It says, it makes apparent the unhallowed desires, the infidelity of the heart, and the impurity of the lips. How can the lips have an impurity? Let's go to my man, my friend, Mr. Google. What does impurity of the lips mean? Oh, no, they were, let me see. Oh, 14. Why focus on impurity of lips versus the heart? In Isaiah 6 and 5, it says, and this is the uh, National uh, a Standard Bible. Then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man or woman of unclean lips. Come on, go to the next part. Okay, it says, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man or a woman of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Why does Isaiah focus on the impurity of lips? here as opposed to the impurity of the heart which is mentioned often in other parts of scripture assuming this happens before he offers himself as the mouthpiece of god it is to show that he realizes the uncleanliness of his mouth and i had to understand that too with my cousin uh and amongst other things talking about people and different stuff like that so here, uh, it says, This chapter deals with a vision that the Isaiah the prophet sees 
we can see how he identifies himself six times within that verse. Then he said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Emphasizes mine. He was a chosen he was chosen as a prophet by Jehovah God himself. Therefore, Isaiah would have to have been a man of faith. Jehovah God uses or chooses those that have the right heart condition and faith to minister to his people. So, what did Isaiah mean by impurity of lips? We can see that the Bible uses lips to represent speech or language. When there are many words, wrongdoing is unavoidable, but one who restrains his lips is wise. And that's in Proverbs 10 and 9. And verse 2 says, For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to control his body. And 6, The tongue also is a fire. The world of wickedness among the parts of the body. It pollutes the whole person, sets the course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. As a human being, Isaiah recognized that he may have been harsh or unkind in his word. Does that mean that his heart was wicked? No. Because Jehovah God would not have used him to give the nation of Israel warnings and, and hope for the future. So I just wanted to bring that out because a lot of times, you know, people judge other people because of what comes out of their mouth. They condemn them to hell and damnation and everything like that. But just because a person, and I, I'm not saying this because... Uh, I do certain things like cuss and talk trash about people and threaten them with my mouth and but that just because uh, I have like a spirit of Peter be ready to chop off somebody ear or whatever it does not mean that I'm a wicked person you know I'm human you know and I go through different things and, and say different things as other people do too so we have not to be so quick we should not be so quick to judge people just because, you know, they cuss a lot. And I've had so many people tell me all the time, and I said that before, you know, for you to be a Christian, you show cuss a lot, and, you know, and it irritates me, but, you know, I can't say that to people because, again, that's my mouth. And, you know, that's not a nice thing to say to somebody, uh, you know, when they're trying to, you know, Maybe they think you don't know that you cuss a lot. You know, maybe they, they don't think you know that that's not pleasing to God, you know. So, I just wanted to bring that out. Uh, and then on um, page 15, also the top of page, the second column, they're talking about, oh, that's in Daniel 10, 8. page 15 oh almost 17 that's why <clears throat> when the prophet Daniel beheld the glory surrounding the heavenly messenger that was sent unto him he was overwhelmed with the sense of his own weakness and imperfection describing the effect of the wonderful scene he says there remained no strength in me for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption and I retain no strength. Daniel 10 8. Let's go back over here again. If I had came on earlier I would have done this in review so just look at this as review. Oh excuse me. Uh -oh. On that road when I eat stuff I shouldn't have no business eating I get indigestion like that. Knowing I shouldn't That's why I take my time doing review. 
And so if I read something tonight, I'll review it next week if I think it warrants um, explanation. Okay, the commentaries for Daniel 10 8. So I was left alone and saw this great vision. Let's go. This is from BibleHub.com. Therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Okay, now there's a couple of, uh, on a Bible hub, hub there's a couple of uh, breakdowns of that. I'm just going to go to this one, uh, Matthew Henry's concise uh, commentary on uh, Daniel 10, 1-9. It says, this chapter relates the beginning of Daniel's last vision, which is continued to the end of the book. The time would be long before all would be accomplished and much of it yet uh, fulfilled. Christ appeared to Daniel in a glorious form and it, and it should engage us to think highly and honorably of him. Let us admire his condescension for us and our salvation. There remain no strength in Daniel. The greatest and best of men cannot bear the full discoveries of the divine glory, for no man can see it and live. But glorified saints see Christ as he is and can bear the sight. How dreadful soever Christ may appear to those under convictions of sin. There is enough in his word to quiet their spirits. So uh, always remember, like I said, go to uh, Google, and if you find something you don't understand, I go over it. Uh, then you can uh, understand the commentary. That's why it's good to have a commentary. But for the sake of this video, I am going to just use Google. But that's why I say get a Bible with commentary in it. So last time also the uh, word impotent came up. And uh, the definition for uh, impenitent, I said impotent, <laughs> see, I ain't well, um, impenitent, my bad, impenitent, not feeling shame or regret about one's action. That was on page 16 where it says the impenitent sometimes excuse themselves by saying of professed Christians, I am as good as they are. They are not no more self-denying, sober, or circumspect in their content than I am. When you're impenitent, that means, you know, that you are always looking at somebody else and you're not feeling um, no pain and shame about yourself, but you, you're talking about everybody else. So it says, not feeling shame or regret about your actions or your attitudes. And that's why it says right here, the impenitent, impenitent sometimes accuse themselves by saying of professed Christians, I am as good as they are. So, you know, that's how it's just like, uh, not, uh, what you call it, uh, Like they said, not looking at your own faults, but seeing other faults, okay? So, uh, then uh, we had some, uh, we had some questions about those, so I uh, just wanted to check those out right quick. So, let's go ahead and begin again uh, on uh, 731, which is was yesterday. Um, the finishing column says, beware of procrastination. Do not put off the work of forsaking your sins and seeking purity of the heart through Jesus. Here is where thousands upon thousands have made their mistakes to their eternal loss. I will not here dwell upon the shortness and uncertainty of life, but there is a terrible danger, a danger not sufficiently understood in delaying to yield to the pleading voice of God's Holy Spirit. In choosing to live in sin, for such this delay really is. Sin, however small it may be esteemed, can be indulged in only at the peril of infinite loss. What we do not overcome will overcome us and work out our destruction. That's 
simple. Okay, what you don't repent about can end up coming back and haunt you. Adam and Eve persuaded themselves that in so small a matter as eating of the forbidden fruit, there could not result such terrible consequences as God had declared. But this small matter was the transgression of God's immutable and holy law, and it separated man from God and opened the floodgates of death and untold woe upon our world. Age after age, there has gone up from our earth a continual cry of mourning, and the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together in pain as a consequence of man's disobedience. That's why obedience is so important to God, uh, that he wants us to be obedient. It's so important that, that we be obedient to God, for God, and about what he says and asks us to do. Heaven itself has felt the effects of his rebellion against God. Calvary stands as a memorial of the amazing sacrifice required to atone for the uh, transgression of the divine law. Let us not regard sin as a trivial thing. And that's a sermon in and of itself right there. In fact, let me uh, mark that. Let us not regard sin as a trivial thing. For every act of transgression, every neglect or rejection of the grace of Christ is reacting upon itself. It is hardening the heart, depraving the will, benumbing the understanding, and not only making you less inclined to yield, but less capable of yielding to the tender pleading of God's Spirit. That's deep right there because what it's saying is that, you know, if you keep putting it off, keep putting it off, one day you're not going to be able to come back and say, okay, I'm ready. Basically, that's what it's saying. Let me read that again. Every act of transgression, every neglect or rejection of the grace of Christ is reacting upon yourself. It is hardening the heart, depraving the will, benumbing the understanding and not only making you less inclined to yield but less capable of yielding to the tender pleading of God's Holy Spirit capable is the key word you won't even be capable of saying Lord here I am or Lord I'm ready or Lord help me that's it's just not gonna happen it's not gonna come out your mouth it's because your heart your heart has hardened Many, it's almost like the uh, little boy that cried wolf. You know, you keep saying, hey, there's a wolf, there's a wolf, there's a wolf, there's a wolf. And then the wolf really show up and then, hey, nobody believes you. Well, in a way, that's the same thing you're talking about right there. You know, are uh, you being less inclined to yield? You know, somebody keeps telling you, hey, you need to change your life. Hey, you know, you need to do this. Hey, you need to do that. And uh, you keep putting it off like, you know, yeah, uh, one of these days, or you can't tell me nothing, or hey, I'm grown, or whatever, however you approach it. But sooner or later, you know, you're going to keep uh, using those excuses not to yield to the Spirit, and then the Spirit's going to be gone from uh, your presence, and you're not going to be able to uh, see it, hear it, feel it, acknowledge it, or anything else, in a nutshell. I'm not here to do sermons. I'm here to uh, just read and make a little commentary. And I know by me going on YouTube, uh, I don't know how to um, send it off to just the people in our group, but I know somebody might say something crazy or whatever. Well, you know, my, <laughs> I had to, I had to, uh, <laughs> I had to close my lip on that for a minute. But um, I just say, God bless you, and. Um, you know, this is something, a group thing, and um, we value your opinions. Did I do that good? <laughs> okay. Many are quieting a troubled conscience with the thought that they can change a course of evil when they choose. I thought that too. I'm like, I got this. I can change this anytime I want to. And I've seen some of the best feel the same way. And I've seen some of them never come back. Never come back. That they can trifle with the invitation. Ooh, I get chills. 
that you can trifle with the invitations of mercy and yet be again and again impressed. They think that after doing despite to the spirit of grace, after casting their influence on the side of Satan, in a moment of terrible extremity, they can change their course. Do you know that once Satan get hold to you, once you tell him, you know, basically tell him that, you know, here, here I am, you know, do with me what you will, he's not just going to let you go, you know? So that's kind of what they're saying right there in a nutshell. In a moment of terrible extremity, they think they can change their course, but this is not so easily done. The experience, the education of a lifetime has so thoroughly molded the character that few then desire to receive the image of Jesus. Even one wrong trait of character, one sinful des desire persistently cherished will eventually neutralize all the power of the gospel. And that's because, again, it goes back to choice because God does not force himself on us, you know. And yes, you know, he allows us to make mistakes, but if we uh, don't come to him at a certain amount of time um, asking for help or whatever, like it says, you know, we're not going to be able to. We're going to be incapable of doing so. So that's what that means, that we're treading on very dangerous ground when we think that we can change our lives and walk away from sin when we want to. It's, it's, it's not like that. Okay, it says, even one wrong trait of character, when one sinful desire persistently cherished, will eventually neutralize all the power of the gospel. Every sinful indulgence strengthens the soul's aversion to God. Woo! That's powerful right there. Every sinful indulgence strengthens the soul's aversion to God. Every time you sin, it's like you're making a uh, how to say you're not it's like uh, I was going to say you're making the sin grow every time you sin it's like you're making that stronger you know like it says you know whatever so whatever you feed the most that's what's going to be the strongest so if you're feeding into sin that's going to be the strongest and then pretty soon you're not going to be caring about the things of God you're not going to want the things of God because you have fed this monster of sin so much and made it so powerful in your life that it has control of you. And even though God is more powerful, but again, he doesn't force himself on us, you know? So when you feed yourself, your sin and your desires and all like that, it's an aversion to God. You know, it's, it's, just, it's like you're, you're, you're going down a, a, a road backwards, you know? Instead of moving forward, you're going down the road backwards. So if you're going down the road backwards, you know, and God is up for, in front of you, you're not going to be able to get to him because you're going backwards. Okay? So remember that. Every sinful indulgence strengthens the soul's aversion to God. And let me show you what aversion means so you get a... I know in, in my head, and that's why I'm trying to break it down, but let me just go on and tell you what aversion is. Not a virgin, a version, A V E R S I O N. A strong dislike or disinclination. A person or thing that arouses strong feelings of dislike. Oh my God, I just felt something in my stomach. Can you imagine that, that you sin so much? That even hearing the word God or hearing about church or hearing about love or hearing about happiness, it just turns your stomach. And my stomach was feeling the fact that I would never want to get in that predicament. You know, that was getting chills in my stomach to even think, to even think about being averted from the Lord. You know, oh my gosh, that's, that's crazy. It's crazy. So it says he had a deep-seated aversion to most forms of exercise. That means a deep-seated aversion to the form of exercise. Like anytime somebody mentioned exercise, he'd be like, oh, no. You know, uh-uh, no, I don't want nothing to do with exercise. Oh, you know, no, no, no. In fact, give me a body or whatever. 
that's the way you would have when you have so much sin in your life that's the way you would feel toward the Lord ain't that deep oh that's scary it's scary the man who manifests an infidel hardy hardihood or a stolid indifference or stolid um stolid indifference to divine truth is but reaping the harvest of that which he has himself sown. In all the Bible, there is not a more fearful warning against trifling with evil than the words of the wise man that sinner shall be holden with the cords of his sin. Woo! That's in Proverbs, the Old Testament 5.24. Let me read that again. Let me tell you. Let me go back to trifling so you'll know what trifling is. You know, we say that all the time. You know, oh, she's so trifling. But let me tell you, that's why I do a lot of word uh, definitions and stuff like that because what, how we use it on the street might not be how it is biblically or, or scholarly or whatever like that. But that's why there's so many meanings and so many synonyms and stuff like that. So that's why I really, I'm really... Um, uh, into uh, words uh, making sure that you get the right context of it trifling okay so definition of trifling lacking in significance or solid worth okay now like I said when the streets when we say that oh they just trifling and that might be because people might say, you know, he's a thief or she's a crackhead or she's a prostitute or she just don't care anything about herself. It's the same way.